Welcome to Grace today. Thanks for being here, certainly here at EP and then the uh, chapel behind us. By the way, the chapel, you're going to find out more about this in a moment, celebrates their 10th anniversary today. So we're going to celebrate with them. So congratulations to all the folks there and Pastor Jeremy Thomas, who does a great job uh, leading and shepherding over there. And certainly the Chaska campus that we have. If you're newer to Grace, we have another campus that meets at uh, Southwest Christian High School and... Uh, Love it out there. Had a great, have a great uh, connection with them and with Dan Becker and the headmaster out there. So we're really grateful for what God is doing and kind of spreading the influence around. And then a huge online uh, watching audience. So we're honored that you would uh, tune in with us today to worship Christ. Well, as you noted in the above video, we are starting a brand new teaching series, walking through the epistles of John. So 1 John, 2 John, 3 John, towards the back of the Bible. So not the gospel of John, not Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, but 1st, 2nd, 3rd John towards the back of the Bible. So if you want to go ahead and make your way there, 1 uh, John chapter 1, verses 1 to 4 today. You know, this, this whole series, kind of the idea behind it was this, this notion that people like people crave certainty. How many of you love certainty? Like I hate uncertainty. I crave certainty. I think it's why we make reservations. Like we want to know our spot is secure. We, we don't want to show up and be surprised. Uh, it's why we purchase insurance plans and extended warranties on like our cars, refrigerators, and garbage disposals. Like we want to make sure that, that we're covered. It helps us to sleep a little more soundly at night. We, we actually use the phrase, make sure, make sure all the time. Make sure, make sure you get to the airport on time. Like, make sure you call your mom. Make sure you close the door. You can tell I'm a dad on edge up here too by the things that I'm highlighting. Make sure you fold your clothes. Make sure you uh, finish your homework. Make sure you read the word. Make sure you pray. Make sure you turn the lights off. Turn the lights off. Make sure you feed the dog. Make sure your alarm is, is set. Make sure, make sure. Make sure. I even have a, uh, a make sure checklist for myself for Sunday morning. I make sure I have, I have my, my sermon and it's finished and it's in order. Make sure I have my glasses so I can actually see your faces. I make sure I have orange Tic Tacs, not green, not red, not white, orange Tic Tacs. I make sure I have my, my energy drink, which is really just Diet Mountain Dew a.k.a. my energy drink, make sure my pants are set, make sure everything's like good to go because we got these new cameras here not long ago and these new cameras like highlight like all that you are, like you can kind of see to my soul up here. So I got to make sure everything is together and then it adds like 10 pounds, right, of weight these cameras do. But having assurances, right, gives us a sense of confidence. It gives us a sense of well-being. Well, there is a book in the Bible that talks a ton about certainty and having certainty in particular that all is well between you and God. Like you can actually know that you know Jesus Christ. You can have assurance of your salvation. That book is 1 John, written by John, the, the brother of James and the, the best friend of Jesus. Now, now John was writing, a little backdrop here, a little backstory here. John was writing to a... Uh, a very confused group of, of people. This, uh, this heresy had kind of infiltrated the church and was being kind of pushed out through these false teachers. And it was this, this idea, this heresy called Gnosticism. The, the word Gnostic comes from the Greek word gnosis, meaning, meaning knowledge. And so Gnostics believed a lot of things, but in particular they believed that the human, the human spirit was was good, but it was entrapped or imprisoned inside of the human body, which was evil. Salvation then, they taught, was the freeing of, of the human spirit from its embodied evil prison. And you did that by acquiring a, a special knowledge, a, a, a mystery had to be revealed to you, and it was only for a select few for the enlightened. And so the Gnostics, based on that belief, said that when Jesus came to earth, that he didn't possess a, a body like our own. Instead, he only, only seemed to have a physical body. This was the heresy called docetism, meaning the Greek verb meaning to, to seem. 
This idea of like, ah, it just seemed that way to you. It, not really a re- reality for you. And so the Gnostics then denied the goodness of God's created order, said it was actually evil as well as the goodness of God because they said all matter is, is evil. If you can touch it, it's, it's evil. They denied the Christian doctrine of the incarnation, the belief that Jesus Christ is fully God and fully human. They believe that Jesus would never, like never ever take on a human body in physical appearance because the body was, was evil. They also denied the bodily resurrection of Jesus, an event that Paul argued was like the foundation and cornerstone of the entire Christian faith. And so this, this dualism between the body as evil and the spirit as good really did a number on the church that, that their, as far as their understanding of who Jesus was and is. So this, this church that he is, that John's addressing here. This caused some of the Christians there to think that their bodies were evil and so they refused to love themselves. And so they avoided like the plague, joy and, and happiness and pleasure really kind of a deranged form of asceticism. We gotta deny ourselves any kind of happiness or joy. Others went to the opposite extreme and thought, well, if my, my spirit is good and my body's evil, really doesn't matter then what I do with my body. And so they plunged themselves into sexual immorality and into hedonism. They just lived for pleasure, 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 and more pleasure. And, and like all heresies, the Gnostics seized on like bits and pieces of Christianity, but not the the whole of Christianity. And their strategy in particular was to cut Christianity off from its historical source. So I want you to notice how brilliantly John refutes this heresy. Let's stand together, if you would, in honor of God's word. 1 John 1, beginning in verse 1, John writes, that which was from the beginning, which we have heard which we have seen with our eyes, which we looked upon and we've touched with our hands concerning the word of life. The life was made manifest, revealed, and we've seen it and testify to it and proclaim to you the eternal life, which was with the Father and made manifest to us. That which we have seen and heard, we proclaim also to you so that you too may have fellowship with us. And indeed our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. Verse 4, and we are writing these things so that our joy may be complete. This is the word of the Lord. You may be seated. Now, you're going to love the simplicity in this. So in order to combat this really diluted, complicated heresy... To do so, what John does is he simply addresses who Jesus is. And John tells us that Jesus Christ is eternal. That which was from the beginning, verse 1. So you need to understand in that phrasing there, John's not thinking about the birth of Jesus. He's not referencing the earthly ministry of Jesus. He's not thinking the Gospels. He's thinking pre-Genesis here. John wants everyone to know that Jesus did not come into being, that he already was. He is the unmade, uncreated one. He was and is and is to come all at the same time. So he stands outside of time. He entered into time and he has no beginning and he has no end, the uncreated one. So Jesus didn't just emerge on the scene historically 2,000 years ago. He's he's preexistent. He existed before and outside of existence. So John wants you to know that Jesus was before he was born, that Jesus is 100% God. And we as the church affirm the divinity of Jesus, that Jesus Christ is 100% God. Amen. We can all amen to that. Amen. Yes, yes, and yes. And this eternal Jesus became a historical figure by coming to earth and taking on human flesh. We read about this in the gospel of John 1:14, right? And the word became flesh and dwelt among us. So the Bible teaches that Jesus took on a body like ours, that he created the world and then he entered into the world that he created as a real Jewish man born to a Jewish mother in Israel in the first century. 
that Jesus worked a real job as a carpenter. He really got splinters. He had a real body and real emotions and real feelings. He really experienced pain. He faced temptation. He physically suffered and bled and died on the cross for the sins of humanity. And his body was buried, dead and buried, and then raised from the dead three days later. Now, now this directly refuted the Gnostic heresy that Christ was not human, that he only like seemed to be human. Yet John asserts this can only go one of two ways. It's all a big lie or it's all completely true, but it can't be both. So, so the law of non-contradiction states that A cannot be both A, what it is, and non-A, what it is not, at the same time and in the same relationship. In other words, you have contradicted yourself if you affirm and deny the same statement. Makes sense? Every politician needs to adhere to this, right? <laughs> just say it straight. We all just want to hear it said straight. And so John wants us to understand that Jesus was an eternal spiritual being. He's 100% God. And he was a real physical person too, that Jesus Christ is 100% human. So not half God, half man. This isn't mythology. It's not like Zeus. This is Jesus Christ, 100% God, 100% man, 100% of the time. And so John reiterates this by saying, stressing the historicity of Jesus, saying, I saw him. I hung out with him. I spent time with him. I heard him with my own ears. I saw him with my own eyes. I lived life and did life with him. So John was a legitimate eyewitness to the historical Jesus. You need to understand that Christianity rests on the fact that Jesus came to us and not just came to us, but became one of us. It's what John tells us in verse two, the life was made manifest. It was revealed. It appeared. It showed up in time and space and history. And he's like, we've seen it. We testify to it. And we're proclaiming, we're announcing this to you. Eternal life came through this man. 100% man, 100% God. Now, I love that John is not at all tentative in telling us that Christ's life was revealed to them, that Jesus became flesh and blood with bones and skin. He became human. Now, theologically, the second member of the Trinity entering into human history in person as the God-man Jesus is called the, the incarnation. And I'm going to tell you, the incarnation makes Christianity really, really unique and really, really distinct. Because in Christianity, Christ comes to us. He becomes one of us. He lives the perfect life that none of us could ever live. And then he dies on the cross in our place for our sins. So contrary to what the Gnostics taught then, John says salvation is not about what you know. It's not about acquiring a special knowledge it's not about that at all. It's about who you know. It's not about what you know. It's about who you know. So we're not saved through a special knowledge. We are saved by a crucified Savior. All of God's people said, that makes sense. Secondly, John says that this Jesus, eternal historical Jesus, desires a relationship with you, which is astounding. So you, you need to understand that Christianity is, is not, a, not a religion per se, it's not about the acquisition of knowledge or ascribing to a set of rules or the fulfillment of a series of religious activities. It's really none of that. Christianity is about how to have a relationship with God and a godly relationship with other people. And John announces this unapologetically in verse three, that which we've seen and heard, we do what with that? We, we preach this. We, we herald this, we announce this, we proclaim this loud and proud so that you may have fellowship with us, be with us in relationship. And indeed, fellowship is with the Father and His Son, Jesus Christ. So, so John says that a deep relationship with God and people is now possible all because of, of Jesus. So in that way, Christianity is relentlessly relational. 
So it's an invitation, right? Christianity is an invitation to know God personally through his son, Jesus Christ. And Christianity is an invitation to really know people and be known by people and loved by people in community. And so, and so Christ is, is, not a, is not a spiritual concept. He is a real savior to know and to love and obey. A third, John says that Jesus is to be shared with with everyone. You see it in verses three and four. Now, the reason that the reason that Gnosticism spread so rapidly throughout the, the Middle East, especially in the first century, wasn't because it was a, a coherent, rational theology complete with a solid apologetic. When, when you study Gnosticism, and I spent about 10, 15 hours just on like, what is this thing? When when you study Gnosticism, it is completely irrational, uh, it's incoherent, and it's it's like choppy at best. And so you have to go, well, like, why why the appeal? Why the appeal to it? Because Gnosticism didn't spread because of its doctrine. It spread through the appeal of getting into the inner circle. It spread through this, I have a secret you don't have. I know something you don't know. And it makes me feel special and above you. It's like I have acquired a position now with this knowledge that I have that doesn't make me love you more. It makes me separate from you and to distance myself from you because I have something up here that you haven't experienced yet. And so Gnosticism appealed to human pride and narcissism to to humanity's like gnawing desire to be among the elite, to know secrets that other people don't know. And like the truth is, is that all of us, like all of us in this place are susceptible to anything that makes us feel special or set apart. Like like we're above other people, like we're more special than, than others. Moreover, the Gnostics didn't like to share their quote unquote secret. They wanted to keep the secret. Why do you want to keep the secrets? So you can lord it over the people who don't know the secrets. You can make them like pursue you, want to know more about you, want what you want. And John's like, listen, the gospel is the complete opposite of all of that. John says that which we have seen and heard, we proclaim also to you. John's like, we're not, we're not keeping secrets. We're telling everybody with the pulse uh, the truth, right? So this isn't a message for the select few. It is a message for the whole world. And John says, we want you to have fellowship with God and with us. We want you to be on the team. We want you to be a part of the family. We're not trying to keep people out. We're trying to bring people in. So we're telling you what we've seen and what we've heard heard. And then he says this in verse four, we're writing these things so that our joy may be complete. Now, let me explain this. John's already got joy. He's already got joy. What he is saying here is that when other people trust in Christ, joy, joy comes full circle, if you will, right? I mean, I, I have joy, but when my children trusted in the person of Jesus Christ, my joy was made complete regarding my children. Like I had joy, but not complete joy, all the while knowing that my children were outside of the kingdom of God looking in. Like how can my joy be complete without knowing where my own children, where my own family stands with Christ? And so John's point is that as long as we know people who are out there who don't trust the person of Christ, we have joy, but our our joy's not complete. Right? I mean, how could your joy be complete while your husband or your wife needs to be redeemed? How could your joy be complete while your son needs to be rescued? How could your joy be complete while your neighborhood or the nations need the person of Jesus Christ? Now, now hear me. I'm not saying that you can't have joy if you have lost family and friends. I'm not saying that. I'm just saying that your joy can't be complete based on what you believe about Jesus Christ until your world and the whole world trust in Christ alone for salvation. Does that make sense? So there's like just an incompleteness in our joy so long as there are people who haven't experienced the person of Jesus Christ. 
And so John's like, we're not keeping secrets like the Gnostics are. We are telling the truth to the world. Here's how you know God. And you can know God through Jesus. And then you can be a part of the family. You can be a part of the team where we have fellowship with one another. So, so John refutes. John refutes this Gnostic heresy by putting forth a robust theology. I'm going to put it on the screens here. Here's what he teaches us. He teaches us that Jesus Christ is the preexistent, eternal God and second member of the Trinity. 100% God. You'll see it. That Jesus Christ entered into history as a human being and never sinned. He was tempted but never sinned. Hebrews 4.12. He's 100% God, 100% human. And Jesus Christ lived and died and rose again, enabling us to know God personally. So you and I cannot know God or be in a relationship with God apart from knowing Jesus and receiving his forgiveness of our sins. And then eyewitnesses confirmed this reality. And so my, my thinking is this, why wouldn't you believe the eyewitness? Why would you listen to everybody else who says, no, 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 no. These are eyewitnesses. Believe John. John's like, I've seen him, heard him, know him, did life with him. And I'm telling you, everything about him is true. Amen. Now, sadly, sadly, you, you see this over and over again, especially all throughout church history. Gnosticism is like a heresy that just won't die. It's like, a, it's like a heresy that just kind of resurfaces again and again and again and then gets repackaged in a different way. And I want you to know that, that Gnosticism has actually resurfaced again in our time today and is heavily influencing our, our cultural views of, of identity. For example, a lot of people believe, and this, this is a very Gnostic kind of, of ideology, a lot of people believe that freedom is found by, by escaping the natural order of things. So a lot of people believe that God's created order is inherently evil and oppressive. It's why I think you're seeing such a, uh, a profound rebellion today against God's natural order and what the Bible says about sexuality and gender and marriage and men's and women's roles. Those categories are, are now seen as oppressive and restrictive and reprehensible to a lot of people in culture. One author wrote this, ancient and modern modes of Gnostic thought all share a revolt against the body, against nature, and against God's creative design. So you, you, need, you need to pay attention to that. A second way that Gnosticism is impacting how we think about identity today in our culture is this. And you see this in spades, right? Feelings now define reality. Think about this. We now live in a culture where reality no longer defines reality. Feelings, feelings now define reality. Even if those, catch this, even if those feelings contradict God, God's word, biology, or reality. And here's, here's the Gnostic ideology, that strand that's made its way into our culture today. It's this idea that God is oppressive and God's word is oppressive and the world is corrupt. And so the only safe place is inside of our own heads in the inner world of our feelings. That's the only safe and good place anymore. Therefore, our feelings define who we are. They now define our identity even if it means erasing the identity given to you. And so previously, your identity was based on several givens that you had literal control over, like your sex, your family background, race, culture, and nationality. But now because feelings kind of define everything, people can identify however they want to identify. So, so we, no longer, we no longer recognize our true God-given identity. We now do what? We discover our identity. And it can be whatever you want to be. You can identify however you want to identify. You can be a cat, you can be a dog, you can be a male, you can be a female, you can identify, you can be a king, you can be a queen. I mean, I told you there's 74 options out there. You can identify however you want to identify. That's all, that's all kind of rooted in this whole transgender movement is really just Gnosticism repackaged in the 21st century. It's mind over matter. It's, it's, it's psychology over, over biology. 
And so now it's, it's, it's feelings are reality. Reality is no longer reality. And I'm telling you, you see it in, in spades within the transgender movement. And so today, listen, people have no trouble at all saying, no problem at all saying, God's wrong on this. He's just wrong on this. And the Bible is like repressive and off on all of this. So God's wrong. I'm right. I'm right. Uh, reality is wrong. I'm right. Biology is, is wrong and I'm right. Well, you and I both know that what culture calls freedom and liberation, God calls depravity and pride. And we know that the end game of that is, is not a good thing, right? We know where that all ends because the wages of sin we know is ultimately always death. And so you need to be aware of kind of what's going on. I know you, some of you think, well, nice, nice history lesson. Thanks for all the history lesson. Well, I, I do want to give you like five points of application, okay? Five kind of truths to take home today, okay? As we kind of pull all of, all of this together, okay? Number one, I would say this. Um, don't believe, don't believe any person or any group that says there's a secret way to know God. Don't believe anybody who whispers. I have something to tell you. I'm going to whisper. Don't believe the whispers. If you can't say it out loud, then and you can't hear it when they say it out loud. Don't believe anyone's secrets. This is how, listen to me, this is how, this is how people get sucked into the occult. And have you noticed then that the people who are all saying there's a secret, secret way to know God, they're always the ones with the secret. Do you notice that? Well, how, how did you get in on the secret? And I didn't get on the secret. And how do you have the secret? Now, how do I get on the secret? That's the, the whole issue here. And so I just want you to understand there is no, there is no secret gospel out there there's no secret handshake to get in the church, right? There's no secret information. It's all out in the open in the person of Jesus Christ. Amen? So if people are trying to pull you aside, hey, I got something else for you. Don't listen to it. Don't listen to it. Because the gospel of Jesus Christ is displayed for the whole world to see. Don't get sucked into that. And then don't believe all the whispers, all the secrets like, hey, I got a secret. There's a lot more for you out there beyond the cross, beyond the resurrection. There's more. There's deeper. Don't believe all that nonsense either. You don't go on to, and I've told you this before, you don't go on and graduate past the cross and resurrection of Jesus Christ, you only, you only grow into a deeper knowledge of the significance of the life and death and resurrection. So anything, any secret that pulls you away from knowing Jesus more deeply, pulls you away from the scripture, pulls you away from Jesus, pulls you away from the cross and resurrection, don't buy it. Don't buy what they're selling. Don't believe the whispers and don't listen to the secrets. Number two, don't forget that the key to combating any heresy is a strong biblical theology. So keep your eyes on Jesus, not the heresy. Keep your eyes on Jesus, not the heresy. Study the truth, not the counterfeit. Number three, don't trust any uh, quote unquote knowledge that leads you to move away from the church or move away from Christian community and go rogue. It's all heresy. So I want you to understand that God doesn't drive his people apart. He brings his people together. God isn't leading you to ditch the church. He isn't leading you to ditch your Christian community so you can fly solo and figure some things out alone with you and Jesus. That's heresy. He wants you to be in community. What happens when people start going rogue like that is they start thinking in their minds this, this idea that I know something other people don't know. I'm more elite than they are. I'm telling you, don't get played by any of that thinking. John stresses community and fellowship. So 
the Bible would never say, hey, go fly solo with Jesus and you do you, you don't need them. This church is this or that. No, you need the church, I need the church, we need community. And we experience fellowship with God by experiencing community with one another. Number four, I would say this. Don't forget, in regards to salvation, don't forget that the antidote is always humility. So you are where you are, we are where we are, not because we're smarter, better, better looking, more moral, more insightful than the next guy. We are where we are because Jesus found us dead at the bottom of the sea and he saved us, amen? It is completely a work of grace. So we not only have no secrets, we keep no secrets, confessing what is obvious to all, that we are sinners saved by the grace of God alone. So salvation doesn't make us special. It doesn't make us special, it makes him special. Here's what salvation does. Salvation should make us grateful. We are grateful that he would come, become one of us, and die on the cross for our sins. And then number five, I would say this, don't, don't be naive. Don't be naive from, from this position. The transgender movement at its core isn't, isn't about gender. It's not about gender. It is about eliminating a biblical foundation. And the tool is simply the Gnostic tool of sexual liberation. And so it's kind of a Trojan horse, if you will. The whole goal isn't like sexual liberation. The whole goal is to eliminate what the Word of God says about marriage, about gender, about men and women's roles. So there is like this move, right? We want to usurp the authority of the Scriptures. And so ultimately the modern return of Gnosticism is just a belief system that rejects God and God's Word by trying to, and hear this, by trying to overthrow God's design and God's order. That's what you're seeing today. We're gonna reject what God says about gender. We're gonna reject what God says about marriage. We're gonna reject what God says about our identities. And we're going to elevate our feelings above truth. So, so, so don't, don't, don't be naive to any of this. Uh, the overthrow is on. And you know how well that went for Satan when he first tried to overthrow Christ. Didn't end well. And so ultimately I would say this, like, like don't be deceived. Don't be deceived. Keep your nose in the book and keep your eyes on Jesus. Keep your nose in the book and keep your eyes on Jesus. So you don't have to have a PhD in, in mysticism. You don't have to have a PhD in hedonism, asceticism. You don't have to have a PhD in any ism. You just need to know Jesus. Amen? And keep increasing in your knowledge of Jesus. Keep increasing in your love for Jesus. And keep increasing in your obedience to Jesus. Amen? And so you focus on him, you'll be just fine. Amen? You can trust him. And I would say, trust John, man. I witness to him. Amen. So God, help us today to understand that we just need more of, of Jesus, more knowledge of Jesus more love for Jesus, more obedience to Jesus. And we know, oh God, that you would never ever lead us astray. You would never lead us to isolate ourselves from community. And so I pray for the person today who's just kind of like on the edge here, on the precipice of believing secrets. There's a secret way to know God and there are secrets that are greater than the cross or resurrection. God, I pray today that um, you would help them to see that it's all out in the open in the person of Christ. So don't let any of us ever get sucked in to the occult. God, help us to understand that the key to combating heresy is a robust theology. So we love the simple way that John reminds us of who Jesus is. And so we keep coming back to Jesus. And God, help us to make sure that we're connected in community, that we're connected in church, that you would never drive us apart. You're about bringing people together and bringing your people together. Your word stresses community and fellowship. 
And and thank God today all of us, we're humbled. We don't think we're better, smarter, more insightful than anyone else. But we know we are where we are today because Christ Jesus found us dead, dead in our sins, and reached down to save us and give us life. So we have no secrets and we keep no secrets. We want to tell the whole world that salvation is found in Jesus Christ. So we have hearts full of gratitude today. Help us to be grateful today. And God, I pray as a church family that we would not be naive, that we would be insightful as to the way the enemy is trying to eliminate a biblical foundation by trying to overthrow God's design and God's order and God's good word. So Lord, we need Christ. That's why you've given us the spirit to live inside of us and you've given us the word of God to guide our lives. So help us to trust the spirit and to read the word, to know the word. I pray this in Jesus' name. All of God's people said, amen.